that should be in that yet. Okay. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Good. All right. So um, today's uh, physics colloquium is a special colloquium, the lecture series on Nobel Prize. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Huang, who is a principal professor here in the Department of Physics. Um, so he got his uh, PhD in physics from Peking University, China in 1998. And uh, he did his postdoctoral uh, work in uh, many institutions in Japan and Germany. Um, before coming to WIU, he did his postdoctoral work in Kansas State University and then he joined the physics department in the year 2006. Yes. Yes. Um, so his current research interest is on the propagation of light in by different gene materials. So um, today's colloquium. Professor Wong will speak about from femtosecond to attosecond physics. Uh, there's one more thing. We have one more Nobel Prize talk coming. It's on April 80 by Dr. Babu. The title is Connecting the Quantum Dots. Okay, so now let us welcome Dr. Wong. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. And special thanks to Dr. Araya for coming back to listen to my talk. And uh, for Dr. Jing and Dr. Zhang from the chemistry department to come to uh, listen to my talk. Okay, um, it's my pleasure to be assigned to this talk to talk about uh, last year's Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, which was given. Oh, which was awarded to Pierre Agostini in Ohio State University and uh, Ferris Cross in the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics at the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Gashin, Germany, and Ein Lulia in Munda University in Sweden. And the prize was awarded. Uh, for experimental methods that generate the second pulses of light for the study of the electron motion in matters. And in this talk, I will first introduce what is the second light pulse and the physical and the mathematical description of a light pulse. The main body of the talk will be on uh, how to generate the also second uh, light pulses. This included the generation of high harmonics from rare gases and the measurement of the high second of pulses. And this measurement technology is so special, it is called the echo second switching. 
And uh, the last part of my talk will be from the applications of exoskeleton like lab causes and uh, followed by a brief summary. Uh, as a reminder, as a reminder, one femtosecond second is ten to the power of negative fifteen second, and one eight second is ten to the power of negative eighteen second. The ancient surfaces femto and eto come from both come from the Danish word femtin, which sounds like fifteen, and uh, tin, which sounds like eighteen. So they are very super easy to remember. Now, if we look at uh, the atom and electrons in metals, their motion are in different time scales. The rotation of a small molecule is on the order of a second to one second. If you go to the smallest molecule, maybe it's hydrogen atom, a hydrogen molecule. It, it rotates uh, in a cycle in 500 times a second. Its vibration. The cycle is, I think, the ground state of the actual two uh, 14 femtosecond second or 10 femtosecond. Uh, femtose second. That means chemical reactions actually also happen happens at the femtosecond level because chemical reactions are all just the brick this bond and the glue that bond, which are the nuclear motion. Now, if we go to electronic motion, electron motion, it can be much more faster. Let's uh, see, uh, this uh, is on the order of one to eight second. How do I get this number? For physics, it's super easy. We know the first order of uh, atomic uh, orbitals of hydrogen atom. Everybody remembers that the one S state of hydrogen atom has a size radius of 0 0.059 nanometer. And it has a kinetic energy of 13.6 decimal. So you have one half, one half mv squared, you get the b. You have the radius e, you get the circumference. Circumference divided by the velocity, you get the period. So the 1s orbital, first orbital of hydrogen is 152s, which is much less than 100. And the uh, theoreticians, I'm not a theoretician. Theoretic streams are more interesting. They even divide the number by 2 pair, which you get a 24 at the same time. And they call that the atomic unit of time. Why they don't use 152? They use 24 at the same time. That is because first, the numbers they get are easy to envision in our mind. It's not a very, very huge, it's not very, very small. Second, it see a lot of ink when you write and print and see money. <laughs> that is the reason of using atomic uh, unit, right? So if the electron moves one cycle, use 152 at a second. If you want to know at this moment where it is here or there, which corner it is, you have to shine a light which is much less than 152 at a second to take a picture. That means to study its motion, to decide, to prove, to pump, you always need uh, an exoskeleton parameter, an uh, exoskeleton light pumps to study the motion of the electrons in the metals we have. Well, before we move to the generation of exoskeleton black houses, let's see, physicists, how do they describe light pumps? Light pulse is oscillation of electric field E. It is best described by A D and one T. You have a detector in shine I on it. The detector has a surface at that particular position. The detector detector will mirror the E B with the oscillation at one T. And it is better to write it as E not T, which is called the envelope. And times causing over T which is called a uh, carrier. Well, in general case, you need to add the uh, phi at one T, which is called a temporal phase of the light pulse. Well, if you don't have this temporal phase term, you have cosine over T times E not T, then you have a pulse like this. E not T is the envelope, and the cosine over not T is the carrier. 
you know, the T squared is the I T, the intensity. Omega naught is the carrier frequency. But for a general house, you do need this phasic the temporal piece because its temporary frequency can change, which is called the chirp the pulse, which is more general than the unchirp the pulse, more useful than the unchirp the pulse. Now, suppose this phase has a source, d phase divided by dt plus omega naught, the carrier frequency, is called the instantaneous frequency. Suppose this phase d phase over dt is not a zero, it's positive, then your instantaneous frequency will increase, like the second case. You start from a red light, and the one time goes, you see this little bluish. This pulse is called the positively chirped. And the opposite, you have d beta over dt negative. Then you have a negative chirped pulse. In a real case, your pulse can chirp up and chirp down. The more chirp, maybe the more better for specific purposes. For example, chirp comes from the wood. For the swinging from the wood, I think, right? The more the wood can shift, the more valuable it appears to be, right? So a real pulse can be shot, can shot up down and up down and to serve some particular purposes you want to use it in studying uh, measures. Well, uh, this E advantage is nature in describing the light powers. If we want to create or control the light powers, it's much better to think in another domain, frequency domain. It is the back face of the same light powers. The front you see E T, the back you see E omega. That is the mathematically Fourier transform of the same pulse. You don't have a second pulse, it's just a two species, the back side. So the same light powers can be described in its frequency domain, E omega, which is the Fourier transform of the E. And in this case, you have again E naught omega is the amplitude, phi omega is the spectral phase. To that in the lab, it's actually super easy. You grab the last house. So we have a piece of grazing, and that is scattering to the range of directions, red, blue, blue, green, and red, right? You know which component is from. So it's enough in whom they start. And uh, which component has those bigger smoking later part further than the other component? That is the spectral phase. Why do I care about the spectral phase? Because the structure of the spectral phase affects how the light pulse appear in handle. And if your handle is not very good, the spectral phase can be written using the so-called tiered expansion as uh, first order and second order uh, function with respect to the shift of the frequency. Now, the first uh, order uh, coefficient in the phi omega is called the group delay. If you have a reflection, suppose we don't have the spectral phase in the beginning. Now you shine a light to a mirror. The mirror will introduce the phi omega. And uh, that if you do what you do women is called the group delay. This group delay is never in seven seconds even. If you like the that house to go through a piece of glass, then this D over the yoga is measured by this error times D K over the yoga. This is because the phase introduced by that material is given by K L. K is the wave vector, and this K is in the over C times this reflect index D omega. And this group delay. Call this something called the CE phase, carrier envelope phase. And if you have group delay, it won't make the pulse wider or shorter, but it change magnetically the delay between the carrier and the envelope. You have an envelope with five peaks of carrier. If you have group delay and the, the group will be delayed, there's a small shift between them. For a lot of pulse, there's a, no detectable consequence of this CEB, but for short pulse, it does make, and this we will uh, talk about it later in great detail. Now, the second of the coefficient of phi omega is called the group delay dispersion. That uh, looks like uh, the group velocity dispersion. Group velocity is the energy velocity. And it 
you have an angular velocity dispersion, it means that the blue and the red are both different velocity. Now your short pulse will become wider and wider because this blue and the red might be linear compared to the other. And this needed to be eliminated if you want to get a short pulse. So we have the Fourier transform linear pulse, which says if you don't have a group delete dispersion, there's no second order coefficient of phi omega, then you have the shortest pulse possible. Of course, you can't have the third and fourth order. That is not only stretch, but also distorted pulse. Usually, if you don't have the second order dispersion, you don't have the higher pulse. Well, the case of no group dispersion, group delete dispersion give us the shortest pulse possible at a given stretch. For that, you not need if we don't have the Set out the coefficient of phi at one omega, then we have the Fourier transform linear pulse, which is the short pulse we can understand, which is our goal to achieve a short pulse. Now, before we move to the generation of the short pulse, there's one very, very important uh, law. Nature of governs how short our pulse can be. That is a famous uncertainty principle. Applied to the leader house or applied to whatever forward transfer, forward transfer, third and fourth. Uh, okay. So you have omega, you have a T domain, third omega and third T, the product at, at uh, least the mark of one half. Maybe. Here, if we marry the two, third E times third T, third E is the photon energy dynamics, third T is the power situation. Is uh, at least as far away as everybody knows the rest of it. It in you know, all the quantum mechanics textbooks. Now, this dirt E and this uh, dirt T are measured very strictly. If you want it to be as far away too, at least, then this dirt E and dirt T are measured by something called a standard deviation. Standard deviation has a very rigorous, rigorous mathematical define, definition. But for we work in, for us, work in the lab. We use something called a full width at half maximum. Full width at half maximum for a Gaussian pulse is almost the twice the a little larger than the twice the standard, uh, standard deviation. So that uh, if you measure the WHM full width at half maximum, this dirt E dirt T will be 2.77 hash bar. Now, based on this law, let's apply it to femtal segment pulse and edge segment pulse. For final second pulse, for example, we have a time femta second pulse, which is the state of art for visible light. And we apply it to the 700 nanometer wavelengths, which is uh, provided by something called a tie sapphire laser. And uh, this laser has a wavelength 790 nanometer. Its uh, cycle time is period of Oscillation for the ED is only six, uh, two point six times a second. Means that in this ten times a second, you only output uh, three or four times, then you disappear. That is the meaning of pulse. And uh, this uh, seven hundred nanometer, uh, seven hundred ninety nanometer, also corresponds to a photo energy of one point six electron volt. I put all the numbers, all those three numbers in green because we have to measure the energy. That is the starting point of. Uh, that pulses. For this time factor second uh, pulse at 790 nanometer, the bandwidth due to the liter T at least uh, 2.77 h bar. The bandwidth is 92 nanometer, quite wide. If you don't want the pulse to be so short, you have 100 factor second, then you only need a 9.2 nanometer, which is much easier to realize. Now, let's apply the, the same band, time bandwidth product law to other segment pulses. Uh, in any second, uh, you don't talk about the bandwidth in a nanometer for some reason, you talk about the electron hole. Because the technique to measure the techn techniques used to measure the, band uh, the bandwidth is uh, to measure the for, to electron kinetic energy, which is naturally in the electron hole. So we just change the H bar. H bar has a unit for two seconds, right? It is easy to be trans transported to the electron hole times L second. So for the at second of pulse is the same law tells us dot e dot t at least uh, 1825 electron volt times at a second. 
that is a magic number and it was well to be remembered. And uh, for example, 100 meter second, that is the second time of the hydrogen one as the first orbit. You need a bandwidth for the light uh, pulse to be 18 m. 18 m is quite wide. Why, why, why it is quite wide? Uh, quite wide. Think about our visible light. The light shining on our face, it has an energy two and uh, only one to three electron volt. Visible light is same as two electron volt. Plus one, minus one, or they go to something like uh, UV and the infrared, right? So if you want to have a bandwidth of 18 electron volt, there's no way for us to achieve this 100 hectare second light using our visible light. If you want to have a width of 18 electron volt, the center has to be more than it. Okay, let's see, find your circuit and go. Then plus 10 or minus 10, something like that, right? And move. Then you have the Edison house. So the Edison house must have a carrier wave located at the extreme aspect is uh, XUV, abbreviated as XUV, or even a soft X ray region. Uh, XUV is defined as the wavelength less than 100 nanometer or uh, energy uh, more than 10 uh, 10 electron volts. Uh, X ray, so X ray is even more, you have even more energy. Your wavelength should be less than 10 nanometer, your, your energy should be more than 100 electron volts. Hopefully, I uh, remember the correct. Okay. Now, before we talk about the generation of the first single pulse, let's summarize on our introduction now. And um, first, echo sending the light pulses are needed in sudden electron tree measures. Second, echo sending light pulses are in the extreme ultraviolet and the soft X ray region. Third, to achieve the shortest light pulse possible, we must minimize the group delay dispersion. Now, let's move to the part of how to generate the one echo sending light pulse. All starts from the experimental phenomenon of high harmonic generation, which was discovered by Ann Lydia in the 1988. When people are still doing third harmonic generation, fifth harmonic generation, she puts a strong 10 sub 10 sub 10 second IR pulse, 790 nanometer pulse. Main draw or the drop in draw is already very intense or very powerful. Actually, the he fo she focused the laser into rare gases, uh, crude or argon, and uh, she found that uh, there are many, many high harmonic values. It's not only a third of this, it can be 100 wines and 200 wines. And uh, now, the reaction is already. Found a three step semi classical model to interpret the generation of a high harmonic. And the things happen like this. This picture is a little confusing, but uh, this yellow is our IR light at a function of time. So it also is up and down. Now, these four, pic uh, four pictures, ABCD, is showing the spatial. Appearance of the potential energy of the electron moving in the atom. For example, if you don't have any external field, like the fixed number B, the equal is zero. Now, the electron is subject to the 1 over R. 1 over R gives you the very deep potential energy where the electron is moving inside. Right? That is the atom. Now, what happens if I have a very strong external field, E? E is positive, like in picture number A. Now, the wavelength of 790 nanometer is much, much longer than the size of the atom is 0.1 nanometer. So we can see that the, throughout the atom, the E is uniform. It's just the back, it's just the uh, opposite up and down, positive and negative, right? When you are subjected to a uniform, especially uniform, Field, then you will have the potential energy of here, which will be DOEX. Let's see this is X. We need to understand if you have a uniform gravitational field, this guy is stuck 
uh, gravitational potential energy mgh change the mgh into q in x right so it was one over r now you give it the q in x plus is so strong comparable to the cooling box then your one over r will be distorted will be giving an additional slope q in x so the picture number P is just a one over r plus q in x your potential energy wheel will be deformed so that the left hand is enhanced and the right hand is suppressed. Then the wheel will produce a barrier. The whole time is a barrier, right? And the electron can penetrate through the barrier. Now, after it penetrates through the barrier, it is accelerated. This penetration is called the tunnel elevation. After it's, it tunnels through the barrier, it is accelerated. You pick number A because we are on the down slope. Well, a little while, there's no E field. If you E field changes to into zero, this electron is ionized, but it has some kind of energy. Then Newton's force law will govern this motion, right? Now, then, then let's wait. At a later while, the E field changes direction. This operation now E becomes neg negative. Then you will have a negative Q E X. So, right? So the electron feels a uh, positive slope. Then it stays accelerated, right? So, when the light is also in there, the electron ionized, it will be accelerated this way, right? It's just like a equilibrium of potential wave, equilibrium wave, right? And this kind of uh, motion is called a quivering. It's not called oscillation because it's far from harmonic. And uh, it's called quivering because it moves so fast, it's on the light of frequency 10 to power 14 or 10 to power 15 hertz. And each time when this quivering, each time when they pass through the hole, there's a probability for it, there is a possibility for that uh, LNS electron to drop through the hole and uh, combine with the nuclear and uh, go back to its original state. The extra kind of energy is released uh, as a high harmonic XU, XUV pumps. This is the three step uh, semi uh, semi-classical model for the high harmonic transition. Now let's look at uh, the spectrum. And uh, in 1988, uh, I and Julia started right. The high harmonic vibration spectrum has an initial decrease, a very wide plateau, and a sudden cutoff. Initial decrease from the third to the eighth or seventh. Those with, uh, decrease comes from the multiple boosting ionization. But after ionization, you have a wide uh, plateau. For example, H27 is 27, so the atmosphere of salt, 27 IR positive IR photon, uh, photons and ionized. Up to T63, each photon is 1.6 electron volt. Then this has a dozen of orders, so you have much more than 20 or 30 electron volt. Right? Anyway, this uh, cutoff energy has an interesting expression. IP is a band energy, ionization energy, plus 3.17 UP. UP is called a ponderomotive energy. Ponderomotive energy is uh, the time average, the kinetic energy of a free electron is oscillating in my electromagnetic field. See, it oscillating between those two temporary slopes. Then it gains the average energy UP. And uh, your maximum energy can be three times as your uh, average kinetic uh, uh, energy. Then the width of the plateau will be three times of your ponder. Motive energy is but a motive, the motive energy is given by uh, numerical values i times lambda squared. For example, for this 790 or 800 nanometer uh, IR light, the ponderative uh, motive energy is suppose this lambda equal to 1 is uh, 0 0.8 is very close to 1 right, micrometer. I, you can focus the light to an intensity easy, very easy to 10 to power 4 or 40 watt per second squared if you have many more uh, energy. And then that gives me nine electron volt. Nine times 3.17 is 27. So the plateau is easily to be more than 20 electron volt. So probably we can have 100 electron second that pass. But we need to wait. How do we uh, separate this plateau out? Although the plateau, uh, plateau region of the HHC high harmonic generation spectrum supports the production of heterosexual pulses. So pulse means that it does not uh, uh, 
reaches the internal internal key log, but we still need to know how to set it out and how to check its this version and how to manage its solution. And we still have a long way to go. First, let's separate this uh, H27 H66 uh, out. For this, we cannot use our normal mirrors. And uh, I nearly use some mechanical filters. And uh, we neglect, neglect these uh, broken lines. These are all the parts of the section. So there are um, conductor and semiconductor filters polished to extremely thin thickness, uh, 200 nanometer. It's only one third of the width of the glass. And uh, you measure the facilities. Facilities is how many positive entities are made. And then you find the light, uh, for example, aluminum filter can uh, transmit from 20 to 60. It's quite wide. But uh, you transmit uh, this uh, 20 to 40, uh, 60. This does not mean that it is all, uh, all bandwidth is useful. We still need to consider the uh, group delay dispersion. So, Compare the, the transmission with this uh, group delay, we take the black part. You know that we cannot have group delay dispersion. Group delay is okay, but group, group delay dispersion will make a house wider. So for this aluminum, probably you can only go from 40 to 60. That's more. Both are flat. So there's no phase change, and your energy is uh, somehow flat. And uh, similarly for silicon, and similarly for this ZR, ZR is the conium, the conium number 40. And plus, you can combine them. I will use silicon and ZR at one of the other. So, uh, silicon stops at 100, right? So, silicon plus ZR, I will get it from 100 to 140, right? So, you can select the band that you want. You have a high harmonic direction uh, spectrum. You select the, almost any band by combining, uh, playing with different features. Now, we have a, another very subtle problem. Uh, how do we get a single part? We go back to our three-step model. Each time when the quivering electron goes through the hole, it can emit. And it passes through the hole, the nuclear, twice in one cycle of the ion pulse. So in each one cycle of the ion pulse, you emit a two atoms that the pulse. How do I set, uh, set the one out? And this is done like this. First, the process is nonlinear. Only the largest crest, only the larger crest cause an electron recombination and maybe the second pulse. And let's see. The larger one can emit. So let's see if I make my envelope of the pulse very short, then I can. Reduce the uh, the, the relative strength of the one of the crest with respect to with respect to others. Let's call this negative crest uh, the chart of negative crest. For example, here you have uh, tau error is the always at half maximum length of the laser. T naught is the period of the light, the IR light, the carrier wave. Now, if you have a two point eight oscillation inside, then you will have something like a five crests. Right. If you have a lot of press inside, then it's hard to make one strong and others smaller. So you need to make the pulse shorter. And the calculation shows, calculation shows that at least you need a tau L over T naught. If a two means in the envelope of the pulse, you have only two oscillations. Two oscillations give you four or three crests. And that is not enough. And people found that even at this uh, case, you have only two oscillations. And the envelope. The phase between the carrier and the envelope, which is called the carrier envelope phase, still measures. For example, this uh, picture number C and E both has the same duration, two seconds. But the cosine wave and the cosine wave is different. The bottom is the cosine wave. Cosine carrier has only one peak, strongest peak, or other small. But if you have a same uh, carrier, for example, this phase. And C E phase equals negative pair over two. Same function is uh, all the function. Right? Then you have two peaks larger, two larger peaks. They compete. You will emit two asynchronous. 
So in summary, in order to produce only a single extra second pulse, the IR laser, the fundamental laser, needs to be first a few seconds pulse, uh, less than two seconds. Second, it must be a cosine pulse. So that the, the highest uh, crest matches the, with the highest uh, umbrella of the thing. So only one crest is singled out. Now you, you see the overall energy. Only that guy emits the uh, at the same house. Otherwise, many other crests also emit and give you a cross track. And we, don't, we do not mean that the cross track is no use. House track has its own particular use. But for some use, uh, some of the applications, we don't need a single at the same house. Okay, now move on to how do people uh, measure the concept of short pulse. We start with the conventional technique, technique called a strict camera. So for, let's say, picosecond pulse or sub picosecond pulse, the strategy is uh, one picosecond. How do people measure the weights? So we don't have an uh, oscillate scoop which can give you a picosecond pulse. Oscillate scoop can work only at uh, 0 0.5 nanoseconds. That this is already a kind of thing, right? So to measure the picosecond pulse, the strict camera technique is you shine this uh, pulse, which is bluish, on a piece of metal film. So you transfer the light pulse into photoelectron pulse, which is very feasible because photoionization is thought to be instantaneous. Right? So that IT is given by the N at T, carried by the photoelectrons. Now the photoelectron hits on the screen, still is one spot. You cannot, you don't know how. How long it last time. But the streak exists. I give it a transversal perpendicular EV, which changes very fast, extremely fast. The first electron feels one volt, the last electron feels one thousand volt. One kilovolt is not difficult in the lab. But in a very short while, if you have a big second, I only have several big seconds for 100 seconds of rising time. So the VT added to the deflection plates is given here. So the electrons are differently accelerated. They will have a vertical displacement. Then on your screen, you will see a line. That line is called a streak. How long the line is, how long the pulse is, is some mathematical manipulation. That is the traditional streak camera. But this camera does not apply to all if you want to measure one picosecond of laser pulse, this uh, one picosecond must occupy a substantial or noticeable at least amount of time with the slope right in time of the VH from T. Right? So that is the first and the last uh, has enough different uh, enough voltage difference to be distinguished. So for picosecond pulse, you need the uh, 500 picosecond of the rising time. You have a few picoseconds and you still can do it. So for picosecond of pulse, maybe nanosecond rising time is okay. Now, if you have petrosecond of pulse, you need a petrosecond of rising time at least for the voltage VT. And we don't have any voltage or any instrument that can provide that can provide a rising time of one second. Right? So we don't we cannot have a traditional strict camera technique to measure passing pulse. But with, we have smart scientists. We do have a nature rising voltage, rising field at the final second level. Remember, the higher pulse is carried by the, the, the transcendent pulse is carried by this carrier wave, 790 nanometer higher period of 2.6 centimeter, right? right? Half of them is 1.3 centimeter. That the laser, very little pulse, provide a rising field. And we use the mirror as so that is the principle of eta second of streaking. So we have an eta second of pulse for, uh, produced. So eta second pulse is a low color, and it has the gas the gas character is uh, yellow color, and it produces the electron pulse duplicate, which is uh, purplish. Now, at the same time, we use the original IR light. That the same light is used for the high amount of vibration. The same light that is used to produce the X-U-A X-Segment light. Use that as a straight field. 
it changes the momentum distribution of the, of the electrons. The momentum change is only determined by this release time because you, when you change the delay, then you have the release time. For example, if you push the blue a little further, then you have more crests in that with the, with the electron. If you put the, uh, the blue like second pulse toward us, then you have only small ripples getting back with the, with the electrons. So electron, those electron, the electron had the initial kind of energy, but it's modified by the IR laser. So this IR laser now get a new name, streaking pulse, streaking field, dressing field. Right. Okay. Now the final kinetic energy distribution of the electrons are recorded as a function of the delay time between the XUV and the error pulse. So this, as we have mentioned, this blue XUV or the X second pulse can be pushed in time uh, over the backward. So at the each delay, you measure the kinetic energy distribution of the photoelectrons. You do a lot of measurement. Then the uh, complicated deconvolution algorithm algorithm is used. To recover the fields of the SUV and the field of the air, if you want. Okay, this is the technique of auto segment switching. We will have the video later. And this is the experimental setup in Mr. Krauss group. And you start with the IR in the center the second uh, 790 nanometer, you hook it into the gas drive, uh, hook it into new, and this is the actual picture, I believe, right? Then you generate it every second. Together, you have the IR left. And then there's uh, the colonial field is glued, sticked on a piece of pedicle. So the field only let the XUV go and block the IR. So this IR is hollow, is hollow here. The center is only the XUV. Because of the DR field. Now there's an iris to limit the size and energy of the IR. And we don't want to limit the electric that is the new generated very big. And then it is focused into something you are used to, you use to do the fiber sector streaking technique. And here there's a key technique, the delay of the XUV pulse is controlled by. You have this uh, spherical mirror. The mirror has a hook. So the external part uh, hooks the IR light and it's fixed in space. The well, IR is always repeating exactly the same. But the XUV, the extra second pulse, is controlled by the PZT. The Japanese moment the PZT is their magic. It's uh, moment 90 degrees and uh, if you apply voltage on it, you can change its shape. It's like a piece of electric. What is it? Piece of electric? Yeah, piezo electric. That's new stuff. All this P B Z R T I is a chemical. Right. Okay. This piezo electric transducer, you can change the shape by nanometer. You can let it move by nanometer. Very accurate. So remember the the whole wavelength of the seven ninety is seven hundred nine. 90 nanometers, right, right? You can do the delay very accurate. So you do the delay, and then you measure the produced, uh, the kind of energy distribution of the produced uh, uh, the electrons. Then you know how wide is the XUV pulse. Okay, here is a real setup, real lab for the happy master of at a second uh, lab pulse, Mr. Krauss. At uh, Max Planck Institute for quantum optics. By the way, Dr. Kapali graduated uh, partly from Max Planck Institute uh, for quantum uh, optics. Okay, and uh, actual result of the Edison uh, Light House. So, what you do is you have a delay, you have kinetic energy, uh, the kinetic energy spectrum of the electrons produced by the XUV pulse. And uh, the IR pulse will modify, modify the 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 energy of the XUV pulse, so it will be created, created depending on the delay time. And then you can recover the intensity distribution. Here, the blue shows the intensity distribution of this uh, high harmonic transition, and uh, it has a width of two fifty nanosecond. 
and they also married the church. The church is uh, possible one of the two temple. So if you are centered at the man you have a little church. It's so small, it's only two temples. So the house is uh, almost a foreign transform link. Okay, uh, and to summarize our generation of uh, uh, outside the houses. I have a generation of household family family leaders provide a broad band of spectrum in XUV. Uh, I have a generation of a few cycle causing family second houses produces single uh, second uh, like houses. And I do second uh, stretching by the original IR laser is used to characterize the editing house. And because of the time, let's move to the application uh, of the Edison Light House. I will show only two examples. Example number one, direct the measurement of the light field. Our light field is oscillating at the time from our positive first. And it's called the pepper setting. The two point the six pepper setting is for one second. And uh, we can't marry the process to this movie. Our process is going to work at the process to work at the target. But now we have we have Edison type. Edison is much much less than Edison. Maybe we can use this uh, Edison screening uh, method to measure what's the field G at on T of our video. This is done by Mr. Krauss in and the uh, uh, same institute. So this is the strict uh, case. The electron kinetic energy, the electron kinetic energy as a daily time between the XUV and uh, the IR light. Remember, we have this PVT. You can let the, the you can push it uh, from the back relative to the IR light. And sometimes it's separated, sometimes the for the electron is deselerated. And uh, Newton told us change of momentum is equal to your force times t. It's so true, right? So e times e times t is your change of momentum. And it's so interesting that the E integral over T is given a symbol A, which is called the vector potential. In aerodynamics, there's a vector potential A because the divergence of B is zero, B must be curved A. And if you know something called the cooling gauge, your E field will be the time, negative time derivative A. Right? So, that have a momentum change proportional to A. If I have an A, I will have a E because the one is the other integral, the other is the derivative. So you just change the daily time, both time of the electron. The you will measure the delta P. Delta P is proportional to change of energy because energy is P squared. Change of P squared is proportional to P. It's two P and P, right? So proportional to delta P. So this uh, strict trees is actually the vector potential of the E field you have used to streak the potential. You marry the E, you take the derivative, you get the E. It's straightforward. For the first time, human being measured the E field exactly for the big world. And uh, there are so many amazing points on this. Let's, let me talk it one by one. First, it is so true. The E field is a derivative of the because this guy is a cosine, that, that guy is a sine. Looks like this is a even function, that guy is a odd function. Both cosine only two times. Second, cosine powers generate a single auto second powers. The final result of the cosine is a uh, even function. Third, although in the old method we cannot measure the even, but it's easy to measure the even because it's special component. So you have the special component here in the insert. You assume all the phases for this error part are in phase. There's no dispersion over there. You can find the E as on T. And that is in the light color. You cannot see it because it overlap so well. So the error part actually is very much for the platform, for the platform limited. Because of the time, and I only show uh, one of the applications. Uh, Another one of the Edison pumps, semiconductors working at the uh, petaclerk. Petaclerk is 10 power 15 hertz. 
how do people know it? This is done by the genius Japanese group, Mr. Hiroki Mashiko, Akira Suda. And what they have done is, look, we now have exactly very small, very, very short version, and the famous thing. Do the same trick, all the seconds second breaking. So I have the IR light red and XUV light blue. And uh, the goal is to see how quickly the semiconductor is out by the real light. Right? Uh, what, they, what they do is they focus this light into the semiconductor, which is getting illumination, GEN. And it has a signal of 102 nanometer. Then see the transmission. So see the transmission as a function of the delay. Remember, we have this PDT to push this blue a little forward or backward. So as a function of the delay uh, between the XUV light and the, our normal IR light. So the energy diagram is given here. Uh, this uh, gallium nitride is quite. Uh, Wide band gap, wide band gap, uh, band gap is three point three five million volt for this orientation or this cut of the semiconductor. And our IR light has only one point six eV. Right then, the semiconductor needed to absorb three three photons to go from the so called valence band yellowish to the conductor band greenish, and when the light is shining on it, it absorbs the light, and the dielectric is going to be in a mixture of the state. It will produce a light of it up and down, up and down. And it also is very quickly. That means it's transmitting maybe also quickly. How uh, many very, very often? How many is transmissions? You measure the transmitting uh, or transmission, uh, transient the transmission or absorption spectrum of the semiconductor. So what we do is we shine this uh, at the same clouds and see how much this has been. And uh, this is the result. First, uh, they define this optical density. Optical density is the log of the transmission without IR divided by transmission with IR. And uh, this uh, is result shows that uh, the change of the optical density is negative, means that uh, with IR we have uh, more transmission. So the IR light make the transition happen. And the material is more transmission. But what is interesting is that there's a temporal modulation for the transmission. It always at the three times the width of the air light. And this is exactly the principle of the dipole transmission. For example, here it is a process so called nonlinear transmission. The electron in the very band of some three photons, and the conservation says that you must also have the three oblique up and down, up and down. When you are out, it's Transparent when you are down, it's uh, opaque, right? So there's a transparent opaque, transparent opaque, opaque. The X UV helps lose it because there's a transmission. This oscillates has a time of 0 0.86 nanosecond, which is one third of the 2.6 nanosecond of the IR pulse. So that means the electron dipole or the electron transition. Happens at eight, uh, can be tuned at uh, 860 nanosecond, or the trans transparent or opaque of the semiconductor can be switched on in the time of 860 nanosecond. And the frequency is 1.16 times 10 to power 18 hertz. And the output can be tuned to both at uh, 10 gigahertz. This is because we are not using light, we are using the radio frequency or at the most. Uh, uh, microwave that 10 gigahertz is the limit of the computer. I think you can't find it, maybe some 6 gigahertz is very expensive. Our computer only works at 3 gigahertz, right? And it's also already expensive. If we use light instead of our electric signal to do the calculation, this same conductor can be switched on 10 to the power 15 times in one second. And the calculation will be 100,000 times faster. Okay? That is the one of the application of Edison House. And because of time, I shall quickly summarize my talk. Edison Lighthouse are uh, needed to start in the motion of electrons in batteries. Edison Lighthouses are currently produced by high harmonic generation 
of few cycle five second lasers. And at the same switching by the original IR leader is a very advanced and a very versatile technique used to characterize the laser pulse and analyzing the atom P Okay, thank you. Questions? Well, you mentioned atosecond streaking by the IR lasers. Is there any other kind of lasers we can use to produce atosecond streaking? Yes, other lasers, but these are not needed. We don't need to use that version. Any lasers will work. This case. Yeah. But that